The Q presents On the Ground. Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with The Q. We're on the ground in Manhattan, uh, I guess the edge of the Lower East Side in Chinatown. Um, really special edition of, of On the Ground uh, where we came out to New York. We had a show. We said, hey, we're here. Let's stop by and see Fast Forward Lab because we see Hillary all the time. Let's see really what's going on here in the action. So we are, we're in Fast Forward Labs and we're really <laughs> excited to be joined by our next guest, Misha Gorlick, who does a lot of the work around here we hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. So, um, so what are you working on? What's getting you, uh, getting you excited these days right in the moment? Oh, so right now, um, you know, all the way into summarization algorithms and looking at how we can get computers to understand text in a more robust way. So up until now, a lot of algorithms that use text would just extract out like who was mentioned here, what places were mentioned, and it was a very tagging-based method. But now with a lot of neural network techniques and all of that, we have algorithms that can understand the semantic meanings of the text. Um, it's kind of strange, though, because the output of those algorithms aren't, you know, Obama was mentioned in this sentence, you know, it was in New York. It's not like that. Humans can't understand the output of it. But somehow we can use these to do meaningful calculations. So is there a two-step process? One, for the computer to kind of understand what's going on, and then second, to, to present that in a way that I can understand what the computer figured out? Yeah, that's exactly right. So the way that a lot of these algorithms work is first we find a good representation for the data that the computer can understand. That's called an embedding. And then we need to come up with a model that takes that representation and makes it useful for us. The cool thing, though, is that that embedding or that computer-based representation can solve a lot of problems. So with the same computer representation of a sentence, we can solve the problem of, are these two sentences related? And we can also solve the problem of summarization, for example. So they become very versatile, and they also like give you a, a more fundamental understanding of what what is text and how can computers even understand text? Right, and then that's before you factor in a little thing called language. Exactly, <laughs> and <letters>. subtlety, right? <laughs> like, right. They're, they're, that's the problem with text. Like a lot of people say, oh, it's easy because I can, I can parse it. It's you know, encoded in a way that my computer can read, but you know, sentences are so subtle. Right. Um, I can put a comma somewhere and then all of a sudden the sentence, sentence's meaning is completely different. Um, so it's actually a really hard problem. Yeah, anyone that thinks it's easy never ran the old OCR uh, software years ago. They couldn't <laughs> exactly. even read it. They could type this faster than they could read the page. But um, well, it's interesting because how much how much of the of the of the brains are on the words versus the sentence structure versus things like punctuation? How mm -hmm. does that all get kind of mapped out? And where's the heavy lifting? Where's kind of the breakthrough? So the breakthrough happened a, a couple of years ago when people started embedding. Um, words. So there was a, a technology that came out called word to vec from some Google researchers. And basically what they did is they trained a, a network, a model, using just Wikipedia data. They didn't have to uh, annotate it. They didn't have to say this is a name, this is an important word. All it did was look at what words are surrounding this particular word and it was able to understand the meaning of words. It was actually able to solve analogies, which was mind blowing because at the time that was a really hard problem. And so now people are starting to extend that method to other places. So a lot of people are trying them with images. And this particular thing that we're looking at was using sentences. So they use a thing called recurrent neural networks, which are you know, a new hotness in, in the deep learning space because uh, they're becoming more and more usable to you know, the everyday person. Right. And they were able to do that same sort of thing that happened on the word level, but now on the sentence level. Yeah. Interesting, and it, and it kind of takes us into the next topic that we want to dive into a little bit, which is open source. And you know, people are familiar with open source software. Um, it's been around for a long time. But I think some of the stuff that you're talking about that's interesting um, and, and directly applicable is, is open sourcing algorithms, open mm -hmm. sourcing code. And then, and then the other thing, we just talked to a company the other day about open data sets. As the, as the government begins to open up all these data sets and there's other you know, kind of data sets out there that you can now grab start to do your own manipulations and, and do calculations on, which really didn't exist before, both in terms of the access, the APIs, and then of course the computing horsepower on the back end. Yeah, definitely. I think I think open source software and open data has fueled this sort of the growth in machine learning to an amazing extent. 
Um, so nowadays, it's common for academics, when they come up with a new model, to put their code online, to put their data online. Before, that was unheard of. You know, you look at the 90s and look at like machine learning innovations back then, and for most hobbyists, the most that they would learn about these innovations was the paper and maybe a press release. But now you also get to play with the code. You get to play with the data. You get to you know, take their results and start playing with it and changing it and trying to create innovations of your own. Um, in a way, I think that also kind of kick-started a lot of the innovation that happened in industry because you know, the pool of, of academics who know how to work with these algorithms is really small. But once we start democratizing it and hobbyists can start learning how to use these things, then the pool of people that can potentially bring these innovations into industry all of a sudden just expanded. Right. Uh, and you see the applications blow up because if I'm just some guy working on a weekend project uh, and like one of my weekend projects is I want to train a computer to learn how to play Super Smash Melee, right? It's a, it's a game for, for the GameCube. There's no you know, in industry or business mechanism that, you know, that's not profitable in any way, but I'm doing it on my weekends, it's right, fun. Right. And that sort of work, that algorithmic work, the data work, could spark new innovations that might be useful down the stream. It's, it's a really interesting twist too on just the, on just the, um, the position and, and the value placed on IP, mm -hmm. where before it was really, it's, it's a my, IP, it's, you know, I'm protecting it, and, you know, you would talk to people that are doing startups, and they're, all their questions are about how do I protect my IP and get people to sign NDAs, where open source, is, it's, as much as it is um, a method, it's really an attitude about it's mm -hmm. actually better if I let other people bang on this as well, Lord knows where it's going to go, places I could never take it, yeah. and, but I still get value placed on my contribution mm -hmm. that I may not get in, in a closed IP that nobody ever saw. I mean, that was always a killer. You talk to people doing <laughs> startups, well, you know, you and your, and your dog can know the secrets, but if it never gets out of your garage, yeah. nobody cares. So it's a really different attitude um, that open source really um, yeah. wraps around these projects. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people are starting to realize that it's not even necessarily the algorithm that is their secret sauce. They can show that to as many people and show people like, look how smart we are. Maybe you can also use this somewhere else. The thing that really makes the company the unique you know, person who can solve that problem in the way they have is their data. Um, so that's the thing that makes them unique and that's the thing that gives them some method of giving value to other people. Of competitive advantage, right. But, yeah, exactly. So the other thing that you talked about um, off air was, is, and it's, it's kind of tendential, is really the art aspect of this. And again, yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people would, would necessarily associate art with computer science and data science and mm -hmm. machine learning, right? I think they do have the kind of the vision of, we're talking about Terminator driving over here, um, <laughs> of Arnold Schwarzenegger and his glass eyes. But, but art really plays an important part and really does enable kind of a different direction, a different path, a different discovery than mm -hmm. kind of classic commercial yeah. Uh, efforts. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's also just very important for, for there to be more art around this. You know, classically, art's been the way that you emotionally connect to something. And so far, there has been ethical conversations about these new algorithms, about machine learning in general, but they've, they're always very cut and dry. They're always focused on, well, what happens when computers become completely sentient? How will that affect people? But you know, these algorithms are everywhere. You know, your phone has so many machine learning algorithms on them. You're interacting with them daily, whether or not you even know it. Um, so we should be asking the question of how are these things affecting society? How are they affecting us? And how should that change the avenues of research that we're looking at? Right. Um, and I think art is a fantastic way to interact with that um, because for the most part, it's not something that you can, you know, take down statistics on and write down pen and paper. Data's not there, it's just, it's hard. But opening up the issue and um, getting people to interact with these things on an emotional level, I think is, is the right way to at least open up the question. Well, as, but as you said, I think, before we started, is it, and even in the, in the example of, of the natural language, if, if they can't be communicated back to me in a way that I can do something about it, what's the point? And if, mm -hmm. and if art in more of an emotional method versus a statistical chart or, or, or a bunch of, of uh, data points and data sets and weird visualizations that I can't understand. You know, if there's, if there's better ways to communicate back to me where I could react, mm -hmm. understand, move forward, it seems pretty logical. Yeah, for sure. And, and especially since a lot of the times it's, it isn't, isn't even necessarily for um, a, a 
you know, a reaction or for a potential, you know, um, actionable thing to do. It's more just to open people's eyes so that they know to look places. They right. know to look, ask the question of how is this thing changing my interactions or how I'm thinking about a particular problem, for example. One yeah. thing that, that I find fascinating, for example, is how people defer to a lot of algorithms, right? You can have an algorithm that gives you a suggestion, do this, and you'll often throw away your better judgment and do that because the algorithm's smart. The algorithm probably knows a lot better than I do. And while in some cases that might be true, I think it's important to understand how is that algorithm smarter than me and when should I not trust it? When should I trust myself more? Um, that, that's an interesting one. In, in, in the, uh, the example that always comes up in the news, right, is Google Maps, where exactly. you know, somebody takes a wrong turn or they, or they, they, don't, know, they don't follow their nose and yeah. they you know, go down some dead end, which Google Maps doesn't know there's a construction project yeah. or the building's no longer I mean, there. On my transit to, to, to work, uh, it rec Google Maps recommends two different routes for me. I always take a third one because I also like being above ground. That's not something that Google Maps is meant to optimize for. So I take trains, it's maybe two minutes slower, but I get to be above ground. So then the question is, yeah, Google Maps is giving me the best answer, but how is it the best? Right, it's right. not the best considering that I like being above ground. So you have to understand, like, what are these algorithms, what problem are these algorithms solving? And is it actually my problem? Is it close enough to my problem? Or should I just solve my problem myself? And how many times till Google Maps suggests the route that you take every day? Yeah, or there's a button that says, I like being above ground. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's I don't the know. option. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting, because the other topic we talked a little bit about before we went on there as a citizen data scientist. And you know, you're probably not a good example, because you work at Fast Forward Labs. You're a smart guy. But the fact that you, you, know, you kind of have a hobby of trying to program you know, a machine to play a video game is, is, is pretty interesting. It's, it's funny, actually. And, and I think last time we had Hillary on, we were talking about the little Sony dog um, that wasn't a hobby thing. It was Sony. But still, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a different spin, a different flavor on AI to do, you know, kind of fun things, if you will, as opposed to necessarily productive things. Um, and, the, and the driver of that to really expand uh, the capacity and, and, the, mm -hmm. and the knowledge within people that they can take back to, to their jobs. Yeah, and you look even at a lot of the innovations that have happened in the past you know, year. A lot of them have happened because of things that had no actual ap application. You look at you know, Deep Dream by, by Google. What's the practical application of that? But it helped us understand better what's going on. Um, and I think a lot of that, you know, Non-commercial exploration is incredibly important, and it expands the field. It expands their knowledge, um, and you know it'll come back to, to help you know the commercial people, and also comes back to help academia. Right, right, and it, there is an R and D, right? It's not just all yeah. all, all, all uh, D. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and the R comes before the D too. <laughs> Some people forget about that. That yeah. there is uh, there is value in pure research, and and you know a lot of that used to be funded by the government. A lot of that drove the early microprocessor mm -hmm. industry and stuff. So you know it is even though maybe the, the, uh, the benefit is not directly apparent, yeah. uh, valuable stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely an interesting thing. Since the government is not really funding these academic labs quite as much as they used to, where this research happens has been completely shifting in the past 10 years. You know, a lot of it's happening in corporate-funded labs at academic institutions. A lot of it's happening just with you know, citizen science and you know, open source groups. Um, but it definitely has changed places, so you need to look in completely different places if you want to see where is the real research happening. Right, right. So w looking down the road, you know, you're in this every day. You've got <coughs> clients that you're working on. You're working on core research. You're, you're playing at home. What are you excited about for, say, the next six months, 12 months that's, that you're not necessarily working on now but is on the horizon and you're, and you're uh, looking forward to? Uh, there, there are so many things. <laughs> yeah, uh, so there are a lot of things in uh, computer decision making that I think are fascinating. So uh, computers that learn how to make decisions based off of you know previous events and previous encounters with similar situations. So the common example is you have a robot, you just put it down on the ground and say, okay, walk around, figure something out. And it'll walk around, it'll find food to eat, which makes it feel good. It'll start feeling worse when it doesn't get food. And after a while, it'll learn to walk around and find food. It'll learn how to navigate potential obstacles. Um, so it's really this behavioral learning. Instead of the machine learning how to identify an image, it's learning how to act, how to
how to interact with a system. I think those algorithms are fascinating. Um, and they're really starting to become um, a big focus in the machine learning world because there have been several algorithmic innovations that are pushing things in the in the direction to make these things possible. Yeah. Well, now you're scaring the people that Catherine gave comfort to <laughs> uh, in our last segment, but that's okay. <laughs> and there is a Roomba here I want everybody to know uh, here in the office, so we uh, practice what it's we preach here. It's not just any here. Roomba. It's not, it's, oh, it's not just any Roomba. Oh, I shouldn't have asked. We be, better be careful. All right, well, before we let you go, on, um, obviously, there's still a lot of value in people that write books. Um, there's a lot of people that publish blogs and everything else, but you've got a book here, so give us a plug yeah. for the book. Uh, high so performance Python. With high performance Python. Uh, I wrote it with uh, my colleague Ian Oswald. Um, basically, teaches you how to um, make Python code super fast. So, Python's a great language because you can develop quickly. Uh, you, the code is clean, almost self-documenting. You should still comment though. Um, and so now the question is: Now that I can develop and prototype quickly, how can I make this code run quickly so that I can throw this right into production? And not get slowdowns that people, ca you know, commonly characterize Python as. Right. And O'Reilly gave you a cool uh, animal that actually yeah, matches the that. name of the book, so it's easy to find on the bookshelf. Like <laughs> All right, Misha. Well, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes out of your busy day. Thanks for coming. It was great having you. Absolutely. So, uh, Jeff Rick here again on the ground at Fast Forward Labs in Manhattan. You're watching the Q. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.